name is Sarah Risky. I am a clinical fellow at the Royal Marsden Hospital. I've completed my training and I'm currently applying for consultant jobs. This is a really informal um, chat today about my training pathway and what it is to be an oncoplastic breast surgeon. I'll talk a little bit more about my training, about what we do as oncoplastic breast surgeons. Um, and please post all of your questions to the team and I will answer as many as I can, either as we go along or at the end. Okay, so cancer, as we, I'm gonna focus on surgery because that's what I do and that's what I know. Surgery is on a huge spectrum. It starts with breast conservation, where we are able to keep the breast, or some ladies choose or need a mastectomy where the whole breast is removed. Now, breast conservation itself can be WLE, which is a wide local excision, so just removing the area, or something a bit more fancy called a mammoplasty, and I'll show you some examples of that. If we are doing a mastectomy and removing the whole breast, this can be with or without a reconstruction, the reconstruction itself can be implant-based or using the patient's own tissues, which is called an autologous reconstruction. And that tissue can be either from their back, their thighs, their abdomen, for example. We also operate on the axilla, where the lymph nodes are. Um, and the surgery that we do depends on the degree of spread a patient has um, of their cancer. So there's lots of facets to this surgery. So I'm going to talk through some examples. So some of these are our patients, some of some pictures I've actually taken from the internet. The patient pictures, we have consent from them to use the pictures for teaching and training purposes. So this is a lady who had bilateral mastectomies and elected not to have a reconstruction. And this is side view, the same patient. This is a lady who is gene positive. So she, she has a BRCA1 mutation genetically, which means in her lifetime, she has in the region of over 80% risk of acquiring breast cancer. So for this lady, this is her pre-op. We've done a mastectomy of both breasts. So we've removed all of the underlying breast tissue and put in implants to reconstruct her breast. Now the incisions for that run just under the breast. I don't know if you can see my cursor at all, but that's where the scars are. And you make your incision there and you go up and you remove all the breast tissue and replace it with the implant. Now, this is risk reducing surgery. It doesn't eliminate your risk of breast cancer altogether because it is impossible to remove 100% of breast tissue. So there's always a little bit left behind, but it certainly reduces your risk from above 80% to down to 5%. So this, is, this picture shows the incisions a bit more clearly. Now for this lady, she elected to keep her nipples on both breasts. This lady elected to have her nipples removed. She's also had mastectomies on both breasts. So these are before and after pictures and she's had them reconstructed with implants. This is the side view of the same lady. This is another one of our patients before surgery. She wanted to be a bit bigger. So we've put in much larger implants than the breasts that she had. And this is her post-op photographs. Now, this is not keyhole surgery. This is not surgery without scarring. And sometimes our ladies do have quite extensive scars, but we find that these tend to heal very, very well. And if you look at her sort of several years down the line, those scars have almost faded to nothing. This is the same lady, I promise you, However, implant reconstructions are not without complications. We are essentially inserting foreign material into a patient's body. Now, this lady had implants placed, so she's had mastectomies on both sides. We put in an implant under her skin, and because the skin is quite thin over your breast and she doesn't have a lot of fat on her, we can see the ripples of the implant um, just at the top of the photograph there on both breasts. So for this, um, and this is bruising, the yellow staining that you can see, we take, at a later date, we take fat from the patient's thighs. We can also take it from the abdomen. It's like it's liposuction, essentially. We remove some of the fat and then we inject it into the breast where those ripples are 
to fill them out. And you can see this is a year later, that rippling that she had here, it's gone because it's been filled with fat and that's called a Coleman fat transfer. Um, and we do this quite often um, because rippling is quite common in ladies after an implant reconstruction. Um, and this is her from this side. And in a bra, she has excellent symmetry. Things don't always go according to plan despite our best efforts. So as you can see, this is a lady who's also had a mastectomy through the incision along the bottom of the breast. She has an implant in and the breast has gone very red. She has an infection. She, the wound is open in the middle, as you can see. So when this happens, it's a very, very challenging situation. It's quite devastating for the patients because they have to lose their implant. That implant has to be removed because that infection is not going to resolve while there's foreign material still present. So we don't have a choice but to remove that implant in some situations. And at a later date, we will always try and come back and reconstruct that breast as best we can. This is another lady who unfortunately had to lose the implant, but she's got a lot of skin there. And if you see the incision along the bottom, in the future, we will open that up, recreate a pocket out of the skin and place an implant underneath it to try and recreate her breasts. Now we can also, instead of doing that, use tissue from her abdomen to recreate the breast. And that's called a DF flap that uses your soft abdominal tissue that we remove from the lower part of the abdomen and use it to reconstruct a breast. Now to do that, this is an example of a patient who had exactly that. To do that, when we do our mastectomies, if you remember for the implants, our incision sat under the breast, but for a DF, our incision goes around the nipple, the whole nipple and the areola are removed, and we use that incision to then remove the whole of the breast and then into that remaining skin envelope is placed the fat from the tummy and the blood supply to that fat is then anastomosed to the blood vessel that runs um, in the chest wall. Now that is done by plastic surgeons. They use a microscope to do very small joins between the artery and the vein. And this, as you can see, is an example of a lady who's had exactly that. So both of her breasts have had mastectomies. You can see the incision that goes around where the areola was. And that bit of skin that's replaced it, that's actually skin from her abdomen. Um, and you can see the scar along the bottom of her tummy, which is where all her abdominal fat, if you remember from that picture there, has been removed and replaced into her breast. And that's called a Dieppe flap. This is a similar patient who had the same operation, again, taking tissue from her tummy to reconstruct both the breasts. Since that time, she's had both of her nipples reconstructed and she's had nipple tattoos on top of that. And she's had an excellent result. This is a bilateral procedure. And this is a close-up of the scar across the abdomen. Sometimes we're not able to reconstruct our patients at the same time. And this happens for, for many, many reasons. So initially, they have a simple mastectomy with no reconstruction. And we can come back at a later date to take the area of fat from their tummy and reconstruct their breast. Similarly, if they've had an implant in and it's been lost because of infection, then also we can come back in and either try another implant or replace it, replace the breast with tissue from their abdomen. Because it's not done at the same time and it's done at a later date, this is the kind of result that you get. Again, this lady's had a nipple reconstruction and a nipple tattoo, but all of that skin in the lower half of the breast is from her abdomen. Sometimes things can be a bit tricky and we've got to get a little bit creative. Now in 2010, this patient who's not had any surgery yet came to us and she needed um, mastectomies on both sides. She needed both of her nipples removed, but she also needed further treatment. So we didn't 
put in full-size implants immediately. We put in a deflated implant, and that's called an expander. And sometimes that's really useful if you're worried about wound healing, if the patient needs radiotherapy, which affects wound healing. So you put in an expander, which is a deflated implant, and over time, they have a little port out to the patient's side, and you inject it with saline, and it slowly inflates. And when you've got it up to the right size, when that skin is all stretched and healed, you go back in and you replace it with a permanent implant. This is a staged procedure, but it has equally good results. The disadvantage is that obviously your patients are having multiple operations in order to achieve the result, but it's better than going straight in with an implant and then having a situation where the wounds haven't healed and you have to remove that implant. This patient's also had her nipples reconstructed and tattooed. So this is a close-up of a 3D nipple tattoo. Um, and you can see all the, so this is literally a tattoo. We can't use industry grade ink on the NHS. So these tattoos do fade with time and they need to be topped up, um, I think six monthly, or maybe, I can't remember the exact frequency. Sometimes we lose nipples. So this patient had a mastectomy on both sides and the plan was to keep the nipple, but the nipple is a very, very vulnerable area and it can become necrotic. And you can see on the picture on the left that the implant is exposed. So the whole area of the nipple has become necrotic. The implant is visible underneath. And in this situation, you do have to remove the implant you do have to divide all of that skin back to healthy tissue and, and then come back at a later date uh, to give her another breast shape, either with another implant or with a tissue-based reconstruction. Now there are, not everyone needs a mastectomy. So all of the ladies that I've just shown you all had the whole breast removed. Sometimes all they need is just a small breast cancer, one or two centimeters removed. Now, traditionally they, we used to make a little incision over the scar, um, over the lump. So you just make a little incision over the lump, go in and remove your breast cancer. But now breast surgeons, we're learning more and more plastic surgery techniques. And we like things to look neater and our patients' expectations are higher. So we place our incision now around the areola. We make our incision X marks where the cancer is. So through the incision around the areola, we can tunnel down and remove the area of breast cancer and put the breast back together. Without, and because the area that you're removing is so small, it doesn't really change the shape of your breast very much after doing it. The second incision that you can see at the back there is from auxiliary surgery. So most patients, if not all, will have the breast cancer removed and then lymph nodes removed from under their armpit as well. And these heal really nicely and nicer for the patient than having a scar placed somewhere over their breast. And this is what it looks like after it's healed um, some years down the line. However, sometimes, so the green X marks the breast cancer. And this patient has very large totic breasts. So totic means that, it's, that they've dropped and for these ladies, we can offer them not only to remove their breast cancer, but we can offer them breast reduction of both breasts at the same time. Now, this is great for the patients as often most of them have wanted a breast reduction anyway, which is becoming increasingly difficult to offer on the NHS. Um, in addition, they suffer from back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain from having very large pendulous breasts. So this is seen as an advantage for them. So instead of just making a small incision around the areola, tunneling down and removing this breast cancer where the green X is, we actually reshape the whole breast, remove some breast volume, including the cancer, and lift the whole breast up. Now, this is one pattern of doing it. This is another pattern. And this is really where the plastic surgery training comes in, because traditionally it is the plastic surgeons that would do a breast reduction, but as Breast cancer surgeons were learning more about breast reductions, about oncoplastic techniques. 
This is also really useful if the cancer is very large. If you have to remove a very large cancer but want to keep the breast without doing a mastectomy, this gives you the ability to move tissue around and remold the breast so the patient isn't left with a large dent where you've removed the breast cancer. And those are the oncoplastic techniques that we learn throughout our training and during our fellowship. So this is in the surgery. You can see we've kept the nipple. We've removed skin. We've reduced the breast volume. And then this is the scar pattern that the patients end up with. So incision that goes all the way around the nipple, down the midline and across the bottom. And this is the kind of results that we can achieve. Now you wouldn't just do this to one breast because you would leave the patients very asymmetrical. You may do it as a staged procedure, so operate on the cancer side first and then come back another date and at a later date to do the other side. But essentially this is what you're aiming for with breast reduction and removing the cancer at the same time. Some of our patients present quite late. Um, so this poor lady actually presented with a fungating breast cancer. So this is coming out through her skin. And this is where we palliate. This is, we, we can't always cure this, but you don't want your patient to be at home or essentially dying with a fungating cancer. These will become infected. They will ooze blood and fluid and it's unpleasant. So as a palliative procedure, we will offer to remove that breast with the, that area. But in these situations, more often than not, it is not a curative procedure. And on a final note, don't forget, breast cancer impacts men too. There's a very small percentage of men, but it is present in men. In terms of the evidence on how to treat breast cancer in men, we largely treat them in exactly the same way as our ladies, with the same drugs, the same surgery. Um, they will obviously get a mastectomy, not breast conservation for the main part. Um, but I think it is important. So we will, I think they say every breast surgeon sees one male breast cancer patient a year. Um, and that's certainly true for me. Um, and that's it. That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour of what we do as breast cancer surgeons. Um, but I hope you found it useful as an overview. You can go back to any bits if you have any questions. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Ms. Rizky. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in. So um, one is, why are fungating breast cancers not curative? So by the time patients present with a fungating breast cancer, it's come out through the skin. So it's been growing for a while and often they've already spread. They've spread to the lymph nodes and they've spread to other parts of the body. Um, and that's why they're often not curative. Okay. okay. Um, the next one is, why is it not possible to remove all of the breast tissue completely? That excellent question. So your, you have your pec muscle, you have your breast tissue, and then you have your skin envelope on top, okay? So we remove the breast tissue from the skin envelope to the muscle, but you want your skin envelope to stay alive. Otherwise you'll have a situation like this, where parts of that skin have died. And in order to keep your skin envelope alive, you've got to keep a thin rim of breast tissue just underneath the skin, Otherwise your skin envelope will die. So often your nipple or parts of your skin necrose because too much breast tissue has been removed from the underside. So this is why it's called risk reducing surgery because we don't eliminate the risk of future breast cancer completely. because so we have to leave a bit of breast tissue behind in order to keep your skin envelope alive. That makes sense. Um, okay, our next one is uh, with Coleman fat transfer, how do you stop the injecting fats from moving around? Okay, let me go to my Coleman fat transfer slide. Okay, so what you do when you do a Coleman fat transfer is you get a needle and syringe, or sometimes people use an electronic system, and you suck out the fat from inside 
a uh, patient's thigh or their abdomen. And then you literally inject it into thin lines into where the rippling is. The fat is quite solid, okay? It's not oil, it's um, a little bit more solid than that. So it sits in those lines. Now the disadvantage is that, let's say you inject 100 mils of fat, after about a year, half of that fat will be reabsorbed by the body. So what you'll be left with is 50% of what you injected. And that's why you look at your result a year later, you can see already this lady has a bit of rippling coming out. Now we wouldn't have left her like that on the operating table, but a year later, some of that fat has reabsorbed. So your fat, it's not like, um, like melted butter or oil, it's a bit more solid than that. And that's what you're injecting, but it does reabsorb by the body. Okay. Um, and how are implants fixed once you've implanted them? That is an, another excellent question. So if you can see these incisions that we made under this lady's breast, so you remove the breast tissue and what you're left with is a pocket. Yeah. And you don't fix in the implant. You cover it in a little mesh like layer, um, which is often bovine or porcine. Um, and it's that mesh that you stitch to her chest. So you stitch at the top and at the sides. And you put your implant in and you cover it with the mesh and you stitch it at the bottom. So your implant sits on the chest wall. It's covered by a mesh and it's that mesh that is stitched in on all four sides. And that's how your implant stays fixed. So one of the disadvantages of an implant is that it's fixed. It's not soft, it doesn't move. It is very much fixed on your chest wall. Whereas a tissue reconstruction, because it's made with part of your body, is much softer. It's, it's soft abdominal fat, essentially. Um, so it feels very different to a cold, hard implant that's fixed in place. Um, I actually had a question about this. Dieppe, is it Dieppe procedure? Yeah. So I know you said that the plastic surgeons come in to remove the abdominal fat and then the blood vessels so that you can anastomose them with the breast. Is that no, no. a, no? We, no, so we do the mastectomies okay. on the cancer side. We'll remove all the breast tissue. And for Dieppe's only, so the implant reconstructions we do ourselves as breast mm. surgeons, but the plastic surgeons do the entire tissue reconstruction. Oh, I see. Okay. Moving fat and anastomosing it to the chest vessels and then shaping the fat um, into the shape of a breast and sewing the artery and veins together down the microscope. That's a very specific skill. Okay. Um, being able to use the microscope and one that I don't have. Um, so the next one is, uh, in terms of breast cancer screening programs, do you believe that this has increased the number of cases that would never have been diagnosed anyway, therefore increasing the number of patients suffering? Or alternatively, do you think that the screening program should still be in place because preventing is better than curing? So you're absolutely right. There is so, so much debate on the screening program. Some people argue that it is overdiagnosis, overtreatment, it is picking up cancers that would never have caused a problem, it's picking up very early disease that may or may not ever have caused a problem. Um, but equally, it is picking up disease that needs treating now. It's so difficult and it's such a personal choice. For me personally, I think when I'm 50 years old, I will go for my screening mammogram because I'd rather know early. Yes, I may be subjected to over-treatment and I may be treated for a cancer that would never cause me any problems the rest of my life, perhaps. But we just don't know, but there are, there is research into having a more personalized screening program. So only screening those women that are at high risk of developing a breast cancer, that have genetic predispositions for breast cancer. So that we are, we are looking at this, we just don't have all the answers right now. But I can only answer from my own perspective. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has to make their own decisions. Um, we have got a question saying, do implants require changing perhaps every 10 to 15 years? Is that a sort of like another, yeah. after a couple of years, you have to go back in to change Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So an implant based reconstruction needs lifelong maintenance. Absolutely. For the rest of your life, the tissue reconstruction, 
yes, it takes, it's a 10 to 12 hour operation. It's a three to five month recovery. It's a week in hospital. And then whereas an implant reconstruction, it's generally done as day surgery or a one night stay. Your recovery is about two months. Um, but it's not just a one, one stop shop. You will probably get a bit of rippling needing fat transfer. You will probably at some point form a capsule around your implants. So it comes quite hard. Your implant can rupture. All of these things need surgery. And more recently, we've discovered that implants are associated with anaplastic lymphoma in the breast. And that's very new. It's very rare, but it is something we are now consenting our women from with before we put an implant into them. Look, you know, one in 20,000 or 30,000, we don't, there's debate over the exact figure but they will develop lymphoma from their breast implant. So that's another important consideration that we are speaking to our patients about. Wow. Um, our next one is, uh, what can we do now as students during this COVID situation to add to our portfolio when it's been quite hard to reach out to doctors to do research and audits? That is an excellent question. Um, I think they're, they're all like really intelligent questions. So if I go back to what you need, you know, just by the fact that you guys have involved, have set up this meeting and you're a committee member of this society or um, your local training representative at medical school, that's three points under the management and leadership school, okay? You've set up regular tutorials. Oh no, this is teaching. Um, You've set it up whilst you haven't taught on it, but maybe teaching the more junior years will have help you here. So regular tutorials, um, that will help you get some points. Presentations is really hard at this time, but audits are fairly easy. You can audit anything. You can audit the rate of medical students passing during the COVID pandemic, just after the COVID pandemic compared to before. You can audit um, the emotional toll that um, COVID has taken, but there's no, I think the key to a good audit is having a set standard to audit against. And the Royal College of England have lots of ideas for audits on their website. They have lots of standards that they like patients and people and uh, services to meet. And you're not going into firms at all at the moment, is that right? Um, so second years aren't, but I think first years, are uh, and third years will be soon so so get in touch with your registrars and your SHOs and see if there's an audit you can do because that is straightforward your audits can also be submitted to conferences as abstracts um, and there's a section for audits to be presented um, that's probably the easiest thing that you can do awards and prizes are a bit more challenging courses certainly you can go on this probably counts as a course. Is this a course? The series, a webinar series. But if you issue certificates, this might count, but the pandemic has really, really restricted what you can do. So I do appreciate that things are hard, but audit is, a, is doable, uh, even at this time, would be my advice. Um, our next one is, can women who have had a mastectomy breastfeed? If, they're, if their nipples are removed? No, because you've removed the ducts that run from within their breast up to their nipple. So everything's gone, your nipple is just there. So even the ones that have nipples can't really breastfeed. Mm. You just don't have the volume. Okay. Okay. Um, and are different or preferable surgical approaches, well, so sorry, are there different preferable or surgical approaches for people of colour due to increased scarring or keloid scarring risks? So um, we, we certainly ask our patients if they keloid. Um, and if they do keloid, we try and avoid the incision pattern like this, if we can, where you go around the nipple, down and across the entire inframammary fold of the breast. So that's a large area to keloid. Um, it is patient choice. It is our responsibility to make sure our patients are given all of the options. Even the ladies with a really small breast cancer, 
that we can just remove through a breast conservation approach, we will still give them the option of choosing to have a mastectomy. Because I think it's really important in this day and age to make sure all the options are given. But in terms of scarring specifically, it is patient choice, but we can't limit or change how they're going to scar. So we have a conversation with them about it. Mm. Um, and this one, this might be a bit off topic, but what do you think about the lack of teaching of dermatological signs such as lumps in people with skin of colour? How can we get exposed to and where can we find resources presenting these diseases in black women? So I think this is a topic that someone's asked me about before. Because you're right, the dermatological conditions such as psoriasis, eczema, they do look different on different skin tones. I don't know of any resource that um, sheds light on this. That doesn't mean they're not out there. I will have a little look into it. I'll ask some of my dermatology colleagues and um, I'll email you Shivani and maybe you can feed that back, okay? That was brilliant, thank you. Um, so I think that is all of the questions that have come in. For now, I can't seem to find any more. Um, I actually had a question. So you know, you said that you have this uh, clinic where you can do the mam. Is it the mammogram on yep. the? Um, Mom's so off. the ones, yeah, exactly. Could you talk a little bit more about how, what that process is like? How it's done sure. so quickly? So, yeah, absolutely. So the setup is essentially our ladies go to their GP with a breast lump or a breast pain or nipple discharge or something that they notice that isn't quite right. Okay. Um, the GP writes to us, and from when we receive that letter, or it's a fax or an email, we have to see the patient within two weeks. So the patient will come into clinic, they'll sit down with me, they'll have a conversation, I'll ask them what's wrong, what they've noticed, I'll ask them about their periods, their HRT or on the pill, so full history, then I'll examine both of their breasts, I'll examine both of their axilla, um, and if there's anything worrisome, that we can find. If they're aged over 40, they will go for a mammogram and they'll go for an ultrasound scan as well. So we ultrasound any abnormal area seen on the mammogram and we ultrasound anything abnormal that the patient or myself feel in either breast or axilla. If on the imaging something, we, we see something such as that finding in the mammogram that I showed you a picture of, we'll take a biopsy of it. Now, clinically, and radiologically, our patients are graded. So if I examine them and everything is completely normal, it'll be a P1. If I examine them and I think, gosh, this I'm certain this is a cancer, it'll be a P5, but everything else is in the middle, okay? On imaging, mammogram and ultrasound, they'll give them a similar rating, one to five, yeah? And so the patient will see me go upstairs, have a mammogram, have an ultrasound scan, have a biopsy if there's something there to biopsy. Then they'll come back down and we'll put it together. So their mammograms are five, their ultrasound scans are five. I think it's a five, so it feels like a cancer. At that point, I would say to the patient, look, you've had a biopsy because we're worried. Clinically and on imaging, it's all very suspicious for a cancer. Um, and we'll see you next week. So literally within a week with the results of your biopsy. So your patients are already given a heads up. They're already expecting it, mm -hmm. yeah? But if things are at the lower end of the spectrum, we'd say, look, you know, we're not sure or we're certain this is something, nothing abnormal, but we've biopsied it or we haven't or we haven't even needed to biopsy it. We're that certain. And that's how you run that clinic. And I really like that setup. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good way for patients to either, you know, get that reassurance that this is nothing malignant or, you know, dangerous of any sort or have that warning so they can sort of start prepping for what's to come. So is this, um, sorry, yeah, no, you can continue. Um, so I don't think this is unique to breast. I think they have it in urology as well. I'm not sure about other specialties. Yeah, that was what I was gonna ask. I was gonna say, is this something that happens with a lot of other cancers or is no, it just something that- okay. Certainly not. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, okay, so if anyone has any more burning questions if you can put them in now but I think that is all we have for you today is there any more questions anyone you feel free to 
put it in the chat box or um, in the Q&A box. Okay, I don't think we have any more coming in. So thank you so much, Ms. Risky. I think that was an amazing talk. My pleasure. Um, get in touch about revision sessions. Definitely will, um, yeah. Speak soon. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. You're thank you, Ms. Risky. Good luck with exams, guys. Thank Bye. you. Thank you to everyone who has come today. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed. I'm just going to um, send you all a link to a feedback form. So if you could fill this in for us, that'd be really good just so that we can improve any of the webinars that we do in the future. I'm just gonna um, put this in the chat box. Okay, so. All right, so there's the link. So if you could fill that out, that we would really appreciate it. So thank you all for coming. We hope you all have a lovely Christmas and a happy new year. Bye everyone.